welcome to our PI training roles and responsibilities uh, program today. And as we go through the regulations, you will see that, of course, the PI, or principal investigator, is responsible for everything on the study, even though you have a very capable team, I'm sure, at your location, anything that they do or don't do is going to be your responsibility. So we're going to stress throughout today um, how important it is for you to get to know the players in your group because when you delegate those responsibilities to them, you're placing a lot of trust in someone. And if they, um, again, if they do something that's not proper, um, it's going to bounce back on you. So you want to make sure that they are perfectly well trained uh, for whatever the task is that you assign to that person. Um, so I'm, as a means of introduction then, I am Gary Freeman, and I have been in the industry, pharmaceutical and device, for over 30 years. I've worked in clinical research, in regulatory and quality assurance during this time, and I've worked with principal investigators in many therapeutic indications, and I provide training for PIs, coordinators, and CRAs from the industry internationally. Uh, a major focus in FDA inspections worldwide and also other regulatory authorities that might be using the data that you'll be collecting for their application for marketing has been on the principal investigator concerning the commitment to personally conduct or supervise all the activities on the clinical trial and to ensure that all the personnel that are participating in the study then have been adequately informed and trained in the tasks that which you have uh, delegated them for. The principal investigator is ultimately responsible for all the tasks, and therefore, you need a solid understanding of your role and responsibilities in order to be successful. So let's get started, and you, we will follow along with the slides today. We also have a whole host of reference materials, and they will flash those up to show you which one it is, but you don't need to um, pull those up in today's session. I would suggest maybe printing them off for your own reference later. Um, they're the key reference materials that PIs really should be uh, aware of. So this is going to be an introduction and an overview of the clinical trial competencies uh, for the PI. And we're going to talk about regulations in terms of the FDA, which would be Title 21, which is FDA, of the Code of Federal Regulations. And that's the law in the United States. Most of the protocols you're going to work on will probably indicate that they're also following ICH, which is International Conference on Harmonization. That is a much easier guideline to read, and FDA does acknowledge that, and it does overlap many, many of the Code of Federal Regulations um, from the federal government. We'll also talk about industry best practices to try to keep you to the straight and narrow as well. We have a bunch of learning objectives. One of them is for you to recognize the good clinical practices. And again, we have a lot of abbreviations and acronyms in the industry. So if I happen to hit on one that you're not familiar with, please just stop me. Um, you know, chat it through or raise your uh, uh, electronic hand there. I'm now watching that panel. Uh, I'll be glad to define whatever that um, wording might be. We'll talk about the responsibilities in the ICH for the principal investigator. We'll look at the protocol content and compliance. That's why the monitors come out, to see that the investigator is compliant with the regulations. And if you're not compliant, the regulation is that they need to stop sending you investigational products and notify the FDA. So we don't want that to be happening, obviously. We're going to look at the essential documents and the regulatory binder that you'll be keeping during the course of the study. And again, you probably have someone else in your group, study coordinator or other regulatory person, that will maintain that binder for you. But you should be aware of what goes into the binder. If there was to be an inspection, the inspector would ask you uh, for the particular documents. And so you would need to be able to locate them in a relatively short period of time. We're going to talk about the source documentation that you must maintain to keep a research study that might be a bit more intense than you might be used to in private practice. We'll look at the informed consent form. That is one of the number one or number two issues every year when the FDA reports their findings from inspections, something wrong with the informed consent. And that's the way we protect the safety of the subject. So it's a very critical one for the regulatory authorities. We'll also just touch on the HIPAA authorization, which is simply getting a signature um, that the subject agrees that we can use their data for the purposes of research. We'll look at the sponsor visits and the reports that they would issue. This is where the CRA or the monitor comes to your location periodically 
and examines the records. They should be a team member for you and a facilitator to work through any issues that have come up at your location. We'll talk about the investigational product management, the secure location where you're going to store the product. And again, if this is stored in a pharmacy with a pharmacist, if something is broken or lost, you're going to be responsible for it, not the pharmacist, because the PI is responsible for everything. We'll look about the safety reporting and adverse event documentation. Most every study has some adverse event. It's the PI's responsibility to designate the severity of the event and the um, relationship to the product. We'll discuss the unlikely event, but the chance that the FDA might come and inspect your study. And this may also be a foreign regulatory body if that data is being used for an application in another country. And we'll look to how to apply those tools and resources wisely. 